Sup, fuckers. I had the biggest fucking brain blast on the planet at 7 p.m. on a random Wednesday in October, and it's about Genshin Impact. You all know Genshin, you know? It's that anime game with loot boxes that looks a lot like Breath of the Wild that everybody keeps talking about. But did you know that it has a wonderfully complex and rich lore? Yeah, I didn't either until I started playing. 31 adventure levels in and as much lore as I can muster under my belt. While thinking about this st the story of this game, multiple things just kind of in my head just clicked. Over the next hour, I proceeded to be like Charlie Day and connected as many dots as I could making this theory. My theory is that this fucker right here that we see at the beginning of the game and never hear anything about is the 8th Archon, the Archon of Time, or as I like to call it, the Chrono Archon. Let's slow down for a second and actually put things together. I sure as hell know I lost at least a few of you and all that, so let's, let's make a plan. First of all, this theory is based off a few other already existing theories uh, that are already established. So I'm going to cover those theories first to create a solid basis. Second, I'm going to cover some of the details that I caught and found interesting while playing the game, and then I'm finally going to put them together and tie it into a bit of foreshadowing when it comes to the future chapters. Get ready, because this shit gets speculative, but I can't help but share it because I just I can't stop finding connections. This theory is based off two other theories, Teyvat Historia's 500 Years Apart theory and the extremely popular Paimon is the sustainer of heavenly principles. Briefly covering both of the theories, Teyvat Historia's theory states that when assuming Aether is the main character, Lumine gets attacked first and because of that she gets sent 500 years into the past when Teyvat is ravaged by war and destruction. After that, Aether is able to absorb the attack sent his way by the sustainer and is sent down to modern Teyvat and to the shores of Mondstadt. Watch the full video for even more context and more details if you're curious about it, but that's basically the gist of the theory. The second theory is one I've seen, oh, like, everywhere. It basically states that Paimon is an earlier version of this unknown god. See the similar hair and the general color scheme, as well as the same cape thing with an astral texture to the back of it, but instead of being blue, it's red. There's also this primogem shape that appears in Paimon's hair that appears everywhere for the unknown god. It's the portal she comes out of, it's in her pupils, it's in her all her magic, it's everywhere. What also supports this theory is the fact that Paimon, like the names of both Geo and Animal Archon, has roots in demonology. I'm going to get into a bit more detail regarding this connection later, but it's important to point out now for the connection. See, both of the Archons we know the original name of, Rex Lapis aka Morax, and Barbados, both are the names of relevant characters in the Mythos of Demons. And so does Paimon. Paimon is one of the kings of hell, with all knowledge of arts and secrets, as well as the knowledge of the past and future events, and he can also fly. I know a few dots might already be connecting, but let's continue before we get too eager. There's still a bit of foundation to build. So off to the east coast of Mondstadt, there's an island that doesn't show up on the map and doesn't have a name. The island is a home to some ruins, a sundial, and this tent. While the quest is actually pretty cool, the quest, and by extension the island, isn't the focus here. What is the focus is the one stray line that comes from the Ragan notebook that you find in the tent. This item states, This place in a thousand winds temple must have something to do with the god of time. How ironic that the ravages of time have devoured all traces of the god who supposedly presided over it. Also, the literature says that some ancient thinkers believed the animal archon to have some sort of connection with this god. This quest item that only serves the purpose to hint the players to what they're actually supposed to do to progress through the quest also explicitly states that there is a possibility of a god of time. And this is where Teyvat Historia's theory comes in handy. This theory says that somehow one of the twins gets sent 500 years back. What god is going to have that power except for a god of time? I really doubt that any god has that power, therefore we can assume that this is the Archon of Time. Hold on to your questions, I'll address them in a bit. I haven't seen anybody bring up this evidence anywhere, and I think that's strange because if I'm interpreting this right, this is fucking huge. This is flat out saying that a god of time exists, so why haven't we heard anything about it? To explain that, we have to visit the ending cutscene of Venti's story quest. For context, Venti is explaining basically like how he got his form. He's saying that before he adopted his current form, he was just a spirit of the wind and didn't rule over Tay that yet. I'm just going to play the beginning of the cutscene. In old Mondstadt transpired the story to be told, where a tyrant ruled. I met a boy not that old. 
The lyre he played, and for a song he sought. But storm walls blocked blue sky. He was. Did you see it? This chibi thing. It looks oddly familiar, right? So this brings up a lot of questions, which I'll not be addressing because the script is long enough. But it does draw a very strong connection between gods and Paimon. This implies that some or all gods start off as a spirit thing before taking their form. And that makes Paimon look pretty sus. So is Paimon just an early form of a god? And if she is, what's the requirement for her to become a fully fledged god? The final piece of evidence that pulls all of this together is going back to the ragged notebook. In the notebook, it says... The literature says that some ancient thinkers believe the animal archon to have some sort of connection with this god of time. To break this down, Paimon has very strong ties to, which means she probably is, the unknown god, who is most likely the god of time. As of now, when the game takes place, Paimon has very strong connections to Venti, aka Barbados, aka the animal archon which makes the ragged notebook true, plain and simple. But how did ancient thinkers believe this? How did they predict it? And how does Paimon exist at the same time as her older, more godlike self? And why haven't we heard anything about this goddess anywhere except for this one mention on a nameless ruined island? Because she's the god of time and secrets, and she doesn't exist in Teyvat yet. I think that Paimon is the most current version of this Archon, and the unknown god we saw at the beginning of the game, for some reason traveled back in time to stop us from leaving Teyvat. Time is weird, and having a god that can control it while also abusing that power is going to make wonky things happen. If she's not careful and is obsessed with arrogating mankind, then she's also probably pretty reckless. She's probably accidentally left evidence in the form of a nameless island and slight whispers of her existence to be caught by ancient thinkers. This is a huge shot in the dark, but I think it's a reasonable explanation. So in grand summation, we have a very outlandish theory that goes like this. Aether and Lumine try to leave the world of Teyvat and are met with the 8th Archon, who I like to call the Chrono Archon, who stops them in their tracks. I think that this goddess is the Chrono Archon because she somehow separates the twins 500 years apart, according to Teyvat Historia's theory. This Chrono Archon we know probably at the time we fell to Teyvat has not ascended yet and has traveled back in time to stop us for an unknown reason. This Chrono Archon has a few traces of her though. On the nameless island off the east coast of Mondstadt exists a few traces of this Chrono Archon. This is where I think Paimon was when she got swept away and carried by the waves to the beach where we opened the game. Paimon was on the island of the Chrono Archon because she is the Chrono Archon, just a very early and very weak version of her. See the details in the hair, the primogem shape, the same astral textured cape, the fact that she is a one-of-a-kind creature and that she has powers that we don't fully understand yet. I want to cover one last thing before I wrap up this video, and I think that this is the deepest shot in the dark of this entire video. Yeah, it gets deeper. I want to cover the Travail trailer. This trailer has a lot of information, albeit cryptic, about the next five chapters that aren't in the game right now, namely chapters 2 through 6. But there's a seventh chapter at the end of the video called The Dream Yet to Be Dreamed. This is the cryptic passage we get regarding this chapter. In the perpetual meantime of a sheltered eternity, most are content to live and not to dream. But in the hidden corners where the god's gaze does not fall, there are those who dream of dreaming. Some say a few are chosen and the rest are dregs. But I say we humans have our humanity. We will defy this world with a power from beyond. This chapter supposedly takes place in the region of, and excuse my pronunciation, Kainria, a land that's apparently godless, or at least is not ruled by one of the seven. And I think that... The mindset that Deluke speaks of in his voiceover here matches a lot with the little we know about the Chrono Archon. I'm gonna go line by line and break it down. In the perpetual meantime of sheltered eternity, most are content to live and not to dream. This line is actually what ended up getting this part of the script written. When I heard this, alarm started going off in my head. This line is extremely cryptic and could be describing one of two things. It could be describing the rest of Teva, save Kainria, 
as a sheltered eternity in a perpetual meantime, whatever the fuck that means. Or it's describing Cain Rhea as such an eternity. If the latter is true, then having a sheltered eternity fits really well with any premonition of what a Chrono Archon might be able to do. But in the hidden corners where the god's gaze does not fall, there are those that dream of dreaming. As a self-proclaimed Hollow Knight lore connoisseur, vague talk of dreams is quite familiar to me. What this means to me, especially in the context of the following line, is that whoever lives in Kenria has a lifestyle of purpose and instinct. I think that the people that live here have been robbed of their humanity and wish that they could dream. Dreaming is a very human thing, a very having aspirations, so maybe they can't do that and they wish to be able to dream. Some say few are chosen and the rest are dregs, but I say us humans have our humanity. The I in the situation is Deluke, but that's not important. Neither is Deluke's weird omniscience in this entire trailer. What is important is the fact that this fits so goddamn well with Madame Chrono over here saying the arrogance of mankind ends now. Chrono thinks that mankind is horrible. She hates mankind. She thinks that we're dregs, that we are what is the equivalent of the sinner in Tevat, and she wants to stop our arrogance. And this last line is, I don't know but I don't think it's relevant. So I, I didn't really expect this video to cover Kenria and speculate what it's going to be about, but here I go. This chapter comes after the Snezhnaya chapter, although it's an indeterminate amount of chapters away. So the main threat of the Saritza is presumably gone at this point in the story. So what threat is there left at this point? Who else except for the sustainer of heavenly principles, Madame Chrono herself? In a corner of Tevat, or maybe not even a part of Tevat, Hidden away from all of the other gods, which is in line with a goddess whose name is synonymous with the King of Secrets, we have to fight her in some grand climax to the story of Aether and Lumine. And we have this guy, Dance Life, hopefully to help us. Dance Life is a mystery that I might get into in a later video. And that's about it. Um, this video took two tries to make. Uh, the second, the first script was a mess and unstructured and all over the place and honestly did not work. This one took um, more evidence that I found after writing the first script and recorded the first script, um, synth like synthesized it better and uh, more coherently and then made this. I'm much more proud of this script um, and the information that this presents. Um, and how it synthesizes so many different theories into one that, honestly, I, have, I haven't I have seen this theory anywhere. I don't know why. Um, I, I, I think a lot of it is because everybody uses the connections to Honkai Impact, and I, I, think, I think the connections to Honkai Impact are honestly stronger, but because I've never played Honkai Impact, and I love the story of this game as it is, I like to think of Genshin as entirely self-contained. And I, that's how I want to do all my theories. If I do more theories for this game, I want to make this, I want to make all my theories self-contained and not cover Honkai at all because I like the universe that Genshin takes place in and I don't want to connect it to anything else. And I think that that makes things more interesting. I think, I, I think my conclusion about the unknown god being a time archon and how I took evidence from inside the game to make that conclusion is more interesting than bridging a gap between two different universes. I like to think of them as being in the same universe or... I like to think of the two games being in the same universe but not directly affecting each other. I like the idea that Honkai, the Honkai universe knows about Genshin but not the other way around and they don't really communicate. I like that idea. I don't like the idea that the unknown god is a character from Honkai. I I just don't. I like to make I like to keep this story self-contained. But yeah, so that's that's the video. Um yeah, so I might make more Genshin videos in the future, more Genshin theory videos in the future. There's a lot about the story that I really want to cover, and I think I do want to cover the story of 1.1 once that comes out, which hopefully this video comes out before 1.1. Um, I will, in fact, stream the 1.1 Archon Quest, um, and I'll pro hopefully use that footage to make a theory about the 1.1 Archon Quest and whatever that brings. So. 
yeah look forward to stuff in the future i, I don't want to make any promises because they always fall apart but yeah um thank you all so much for watching keep an eye out for future videos they are coming and uh yeah so later